foundation. It is worthy, it is steadfast, it is sure, it is solid. If you build your life on the word of God, well, Jesus said the rains are still gonna come. You're still gonna face storms. You're still gonna face trials. You're still gonna face temptations. You're still gonna face hardships. You're still gonna face lean times. But if your house is built on the word of God, that storm will come and it will blow and it will be, but your house, your life will not be washed away. And if we build our marriages on the word of God, our marriages will last. If your children are built up on the word of God, your children will last. If you take a business and you build your business on the principles of the word of God, your business will last. If you take your finances and you order and you arrange your finances based on the word of God, the rains will come and the wind will blow. But when it's all said and done, your life will still be standing if it's built on the word of God. I would like to invite you uh, because there's another flight uh, that is taking off. Unfortunately, that flight is also going to crash like the first one crashed. Uh, but when it crash landed, it did. I like to run you through what we did last week. We got in a flight and we, uh, so it was actually Isaiah. He said he was going to uh, take us all to Nigeria, which was where we were headed to. And we took off and we went to L.A. We took off from L.A. and the plane had some difficulties, and the plane went down. The plane had a crash. Uh, we talked about how humanity has a plane. We're on our way. We know where we're going. We know what we're going to do. Nobody can tell us anything. And then halfway to our destination, we crashed. Uh, all of us, our, our homes, our society, our young people, uh, our society is in the process of crashing. And when we crash, we crash into the middle of the ocean. And fortunately for us, and fortunately for all humanity, we crash landed close enough to Paradise Island. And Paradise Island it was a place that we were amazed, was mesmerized, unfortunately no Wi-Fi. Uh, and, uh, but that means that you don't have the emails from work to, to answer. And so Paradise Island, we, we talked about the fact that when we walked, when we washed up on shore, it was a brand new uh, experience, it was a brand new existence. And sometimes it is good to have the simplicity of everything else falling away and being left with the primitive yet tropical paradise that is God's word. And I hope that you know, and we, and we did discover, because Isaiah, he wandered out and he swam and he found out that it was actually a book that this island was on and that book was the word of God. And so we are going to explore the word of God in this series. We're going to go several weeks we're calling it Paradise Island. Some people, if you have a Bible, hold up your Bible. If you have it on your phone, hold up your phone. I hope that you know that that, that phone, that Bible, that app, uh, maybe you have the app on your watch and you hold your watch up or what have you. Uh, that is an island that you can escape this world from, your rat race from. You can turn the phone off. You can turn the emails off. You can turn the TV off. And if that ever happens from externally, where you are sort of ripped from your world and you're by yourself, have you ever had this question? If you were stranded on a desert island, you could only have one book, what would it be? It would have to be the Word of God for me. I hope it would be for you. Uh, but to be stranded on the Word of God. Last week we talked about three quick uh, concepts that mankind, uh, there was the crash and then... There was the uh, reversal that God turned us around and we, we actually begin to thrive as humanity, as humans. We thrive on the Word of God. And you say, Pastor David, that's a brand new concept for me. I know what the Word of God is. There's like this line to me in Christianity. 
There's the cool side of Christianity. I see it on YouTube and on TV. And then there's the fuddy-duddy side of Christianity. And then the people that are like, God's word and prayer and so important. And you're like, eh. But I've always viewed that as, that's like back in the 20s and the 30s. And the, the people who are like, the Bible. But, you know, the cool side of Christianity, give me that. The community and, and all that. But I want us to return. Unfortunately, we are going to be forced into it in our lives if we don't do it voluntarily to return to the solidarity, to return to the simplicity, and to return to the paradise of God's Word. And if you're not living on God's Word, I pray that this series will light a fire in you, will make you thirsty for the Word of God. Uh, not to know about the Word of God, but to know the Word of God, because that's how we know God. So... I do need, Arath, uh, you were with us last week, so I'm going to use you, you can stay where you are. Uh, but Arath has decided, how many are going to join us, by the way? You're going to join us on the island, you crash landed, and you're okay, you sign shore. And we, we, we heard you crying, and we pulled you into the shore, <coughs> you washed up on the shore, and, you know, we, we did uh, CPR, because we've already had the training, and, and so we're all here together, and it's a brand new day. And Arath decides, you know what, I'm going to go... I'm going to go exploring. I'll write you an explorer. Yeah. Are you a mountain climber? No. No, okay. So he's going to take up mountain climbing. <laughs> uh, he's decided he's going to climb to the top of the mountain. Uh, and, uh, and he gets up there. It's, a, it's an amazing view from up there. Bird's eye view. And then he comes back down the mountain and he finds a cave. And if I ever see a cave, I don't know. How many of you see a cave? I'm going in because I'm curious. I'm, you know, let me get my light make sure. Uh, no one, any bats to take me by surprise. How many of you see a cave? You're like, no, that's not for me at all. Like, okay, okay, okay. I'm a cave person. I explore. Some of the oldest things in our world are in caves. Uh, some of the oldest rocks in the world are caves that that uh, water has washed through and so. So Araf, he's in this cave and he sees on the wall of this cave a drawing. Primitive drawing. Somebody's been on this island before. And he, he lights his match. And he's got his torch. And he's looking because his iPhone did. And uh, so he's looking at this picture on the wall. And this is this primitive picture of what the island used to look like way, way back. And all of the islands in the Pacific have an origin. They come out of somewhere. Some of them are volcanoes that erupted and then the rock hardened. This rock is different. This is not a volcano. A volcano is sort of new lava that's come up in a brand new island. This island, as a rat discovers, has always been here since the beginning of the earth. It is as old as the earth. The rock that this island is made out of is the same age as the earth. The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And if you believe the Bible account, and you look at the, the chronology and you move backwards, you know that the earth is actually a young earth, not millions and billions of years old, but just a few thousand years old, where God spoke everything into existence, and it was. He spoke the rocks into existence. And earth is one big spinning rock, and other rocks jut out of that rock. This is one of those rocks. And this rock, if you were to strip away all the external things, all the growth, all the foliage, all the trees, all the sand, if you were to get everything out of the way, it is a rock. And a rock is old. Some people are like, I'm so old, I'm older than rocks. So then you carbon date the rocks. You're like, how old is this? And you find out it is exactly as old as the oldest thing on the earth. And that's an amazing discovery that Arath makes. So he dives down. Um, I was going to bring my scuba gear, my uh, snorkel, but I forgot it. Uh, so, uh, but actually, I think you have my snorkel. Everybody have a snorkel? All right, so this is childish, I know, but get your snorkel and let's put your snorkel on, okay? But, yeah, everybody do it. You put, put your goggles on. Uh, and so this is what people do. This is nasty. We're like, I can't see right. So they put two of And then you're like, that makes you really be able to see. I'm like, okay, never mind. You keep it. Uh, so you put your, and then now you get the snorkel in there and you got to blow it out. And then you put it in there. Okay, now we're ready to dive down deep because this gets deep. Now, the, the name of the sermon today is It Gets Deep. 
Today we're going to go deep. We're going to go as deep as we can today. And we're going to go all the way to the bottom of the ocean floor. And a raft is down there. And I have gone snorkeling in Hawaii before, off the coast of Maui. And I saw um, something at the bottom. And I was like, huh, I wonder what that is. And I started to dive down. I was like, nope, 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 too far. Because my head started to crush in. It was too deep. I did not go on down to the bottom. My brother Daniel went down to the bottom. And for like another month or so, he's like, ah, these headaches because that pressure. It's deep. So a rat is like, he comes back up. We're going to need some more gear to get really, really deep. So he gets the scuba gear. It's in the cave. Just go with us. And so he dives way, way down to the bottom of this ocean. And the deeper he gets, and the deeper he gets, the light begins to dim. And it's, you know how when you go deep sea, like, not when you go deep sea, like, but when they go, and we watch it on YouTube when they go. Uh, there's some exotic fish that live down there. The deeper you get, the fish change. They're cooler fish. They're scarier fish. There's some crazy things down there. A raft gets down to the very bottom, and he's now standing on the ocean floor, and he turns around, and what he sees is somebody has been over here before, and there's treasure that litters the entire ocean floor. Treasure beyond your wildest dreams. And a raft, he's got his scuba gear on, so you can see the bubbles. <laughs> He's excited, and the bubbles go all the way to the front. We're like, is he okay? The bubble, they, they come up to the surface. And Arath is not, he's, he's okay. He's so excited because of the treasure that he has discovered, the bottom of this paradise island. And so today, it gets deep. We're going to talk about the origin, the age, the strength, and the stability of God's word. So, come with me on a journey. I know that as a pastor, as a preacher, we normally should start with uh, the Bible reading. We're not going to start with the Bible reading, but here, let's get into it. By the way, let's pray. Uh, I want to make sure that we ask God to, to bless our time. Father, bless as we speak on your words today. I pray that we do you justice. We thank you that you have elevated your word above all of your name. What an amazing thought that is. It's that important to you. Your word is how we know you. It's how we discover who you are. Is how we discover who we are. Yeah. Lord, I pray that today you would speak to us through your word, from your word, about your word, that we would fall in love with your word. Because if we don't have your word, we don't have anything. It is our genesis. It's our beginning. It's how we know anything about life and how to live it successfully. And I pray, Father, that you would help me as I speak, that you give me the filling of the spirit for this hour. Please forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me and please empty me of myself. And Father, fill me with the Spirit of God that you give us the unction of the Holy Ghost for this hour. Make this time profitable. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. First of all, let's talk about the rock. The rock that is the Word of God. Uh, so, two main concepts today. The Word of God is a rock. Um, first of all, it is forever. The Word of God is forever. Here's our scriptures. Psalm 119, verse 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven and in earth. God's word is settled like a bedrock, like an island. It is planted, it is sure, it is steadfast, it's not going anywhere. God's word was here long before we got here. It'll be here long before we're gone. Forever, O oh Lord, before the foundations of the world, God's word stands. And after it's all gone, after the dust settles and every nation is gone, God's word will still be there. Forever, O oh Lord, not just on the earth, when earth is burned away. In heaven and in earth. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven and in earth. I hope you know that if you've got the Bible in your hand on your phone, I left my big copy of the scriptures at the house. But if you've got that, you've got something that has already stood the test of time and will continue to stand the test of time. It is the thing above everything else. It is forever. Look what it says. Uh, there's a couple of, of statistics that I would love for you to know about the Bible. The Bible is the most amazing book of all time. It is 66 books all put into one. There's the Old Testament, the New Testament, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. And those books 
were written over a period of 1,500 years by 40 men. So 40 men from started in the days of Moses, went all the way until John the Revelator in the book of Revelation. He outlived all the other apostles for one reason. God was going to give him the book of Revelation, and he wrote it down. So from when Moses started writing until John finished writing was 1,500 years. And God used 40 different men. Some of them were prophets. Some of them were poets. David was a, a king and a poet. Uh, some of them, like Samuel, was a prophet. Some of them, like Moses, he was like a Swiss army leader. He could do everything, and God gave him the first five books of the Bible, and Moses wrote those down. But the Bible has uh, been 40, 40, 40 authors over 1,500 years, and it still doesn't contradict itself. It all agrees with itself. The writing took place on three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. In, uh, so Asia would be like modern day Turkey. That's Asia Minor, uh, the Bible was recorded. Uh, and then Africa, when they were in Egypt, some of the Bible was given. And then also in, in uh, when the Apostle Paul was in prison in Rome and in other places in Europe, the Bible was given to, in three different continents. It was given in three languages, the first in Hebrew and then in Aramaic. Uh, most of the Old Testament is either Hebrew, some of it is Aramaic. And then uh, the original language of Greek was the New Testament. The New Testament, Greek language, was the universal language of the entire world. It was not an accident. Uh, it was so that the whole world could get the, the Bible in their language. And so God allowed the Greek culture to flourish throughout the world so that the Bible could be given in Greek and go throughout the world so everybody could read it. Uh, and the next step, there are over 5,800 manuscripts of the Bible that are in existence today that we have found. Uh, during archaeological days or found them in different places. Can yes, I add sir? on to that? There's a, that's, oh, that's only including the Greek manuscripts. That's just there's the Greek. Over, yeah. There's over uh, 10, almost 12,000 including the other ancient languages like um, the Slavic, the Gothic languages as well. It adds up to almost 12,000 uh, manuscripts that confirm the authenticity of the Bible. Absolutely. Yes, thank you, Arath. Over 12,000 if you put them all together. Uh, and so this is just the New Testament, 5,800 manuscripts that have been found of the New Testament alone, dating all the way back to AD 130. And this is an amazing, this is an important step, because some people would try to discredit the Bible based on, well, do we have the originals? The Bible is, there's more evidence than any other secular author, such as Aristotle, Pliny, or Julius Caesar, for the Bible than any other author. And, and also, the New Testament is the most well-attested to piece of ancient literature in world history. The Bible is here to stay, and God has allowed us to discover things that just bear that out and prove it. If you've got the Bible, you've got the real thing. And so, it is the rock. It is forever. Here's a couple of verses that talk about how we got the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for four things, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. I like to say it like this. It's profitable for doctrine, that's what's right. For reproof, that's what's wrong. For correction, that's how to get it right. And then for instruction in righteousness, that's how to keep it right. If you got the Bible, you know what's right, you know what's wrong, you know how to get it right, and you know how to keep it right. All of that, not just some of it, not just the book of Psalms and Proverbs, which we like to, to use devotionally a lot. The whole Bible, every bit of it, is profitable because it's got all of that in there. And it was given by what's called inspiration. The word inspiration is a Latin word which means to breathe out, to breathe. The Bible is literally God breathed. God spoke the Bible and then human authors wrote it down. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, no prophecy of the scripture was given by any private interpretation, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So God gave the Bible through inspiration. He spoke it, he breathed it out, they caught it and wrote it down. We have exactly what God wants us to have in the Bible. And then, how do we have the Bible still today is what's called preservation. The Bible has survived. And it didn't just kind of crawl through the door. It is exactly as God gave it to us because of this verse and a couple of other verses in the Bible. Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words. That means they're perfectly pristine. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. The idea is 
Seven is the number of completion. How perfect and how pure is the word of God? Like you were purified at seven times. That's how pure the word of God is. It's not tainted. It's not, it doesn't have errors. It's reliable. It's trustworthy. It is still perfect today, the same as it was back in those days. Then it says this, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, the words of the Lord. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation and forever. Here's the promise God's making here. Every generation since God gave the Bible until the end of time will have the Bible. There's not a generation that will come on the earth and be like, well, how do we know who God is? Well, there used to be this thing called the Bible, but, you know, it's gone now. God says he will preserve it so that everybody everywhere can have a chance to have the Bible because that's how we know who God is. God has preserved his word. You think human preservatives make something last long. God breathed into his word and he protects it. And over time, really quickly, let me give you how it happened. They had the Bible, and then they took the original autographs, the actual letters that Paul wrote and Moses wrote, and they copied them. They, in the Hebrew, it was the Masoretic scribes. There's people that, they're, you were born, you're going to be a Masoretic scribe, one of the tribe of Levi. And they just copied the Bible, and they just copied it, and they just copied it. And so every, every generation, there will be new copies, so they never wore out. And this is an amazing thing. As they would copy them, they would come to the name of God. Jehovah, capital L, O, capital R, capital D. Whenever they would come to that name, they would stop, put their pen down, take their robe off, wash it, get a new robe, take a bath, and get a new pen and write God's name. That's how respectful they were. They would count every single word and every single letter. And after they were done copying the page, they would go back and count. And if it wasn't the perfect, uh-oh. There must be a mistake here. They would throw that page away, start over, because they were so consumed with it being perfect. Because God's word is worthy. It's worth that. And so they, they painstakingly took care of copying the word of God and passing it down from generation to generation. The word of God was the most sacred thing in the Hebrew culture. Then the, in the New Testament time, when they had that, there were some scribes in what's called the Byzantine Empire, which is modern-day Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, that they were monks and they would just copy them and copy them, same thing, and made sure that they would copy it and send that out, copy it and send that out. That's all they did was copy the scriptures. I praise God for anybody in the world today that has a hand in getting the Bible copied and produced and distributed, especially in languages that don't have it yet. Amen. I went to college with two guys. They were really um, medical majors because they were geniuses. They were like doctors, but they also were taking... Hebrew and Greek with us because they said, and this is incredible, they said, we believe God has called us and tapped us and given us the ability to learn languages. So we want to learn Hebrew and Greek so that we can translate the Hebrew and Greek New Testament and Old Testament into new languages. And now they're giving their life to learning those new languages. And we just thought they were like turbo nerds. They're giving their life to getting the gospel translated into new languages. That's one of the most incredible things I've ever heard of in my life. And that definitely takes the hand of God supernaturally touching someone and, and providing for them to do that. The word of God is that important. It is the rock. So, secondly, not only is it forever, the word of God is a foundation. This is really our text today. Jesus, at the very end of what's called the Sermon on the Mount, he stood and said, everything that I've said, I want you to listen, and this is, this is important. Matthew 7, verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not because it was founded upon a rock. I pause right here. My house that we have in Aubrey is five years old, and there's already a crack in the foundation. Because it was built on shifting dirt. I didn't know this about Texas. If you don't water the dirt, it shrinks away. It goes away. It's fluid. And so the foundation was built on something that was movable. Now my house is great. And I promise you, I can stand in the, my guest bathroom. There's a crack going through my guest bathroom. A crack going through the ceiling. And I can hear in the morning. I can hear my house moving. Literally, the ground under me is shrinking away, and my house is cracking in half. Outside, there's a, there's a crack in the bricks. You're like, 
falling apart. We're finna move out of it. We're not gonna. <laughs> if you build your house on the sand, you have to move out. Watch what Jesus said. And everyone, verse 26, that hear these words and sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. You can see some of these videos of houses that are built too close in the cliff, and the cliff erodes, and the whole house just falls into the ocean. Incredible, it's actually happened. People are actually dumb enough to read this and be like, yeah, but we're still going to build our house right here where the, where the ground can move. And sure enough, great is the fall of it. And I want to say this, the word of God is a foundation. It is worthy, it is steadfast, it is sure, it is solid. If you build your life on the word of God, now Jesus said the rains are still going to come. You're still going to face storms. You're still going to face trials. You're still going to face temptations. You're still going to face hardships. You're still going to face lean times. But if your house is built on the word of God, that storm will come and it will blow and it will beat. But your house, your life will not be washed away. It will stand firm. It will still be there when the storm is over. And I know so many people that built their, their life on something that changes. They built their life on the philosophies of this world, shifting sand. What does the world think now? And they put their finger to the wind, and whatever, whichever way the wind is blowing, I'll do this now, or I'll do that now. And if we build our marriages on the word of God, our marriages will last. If, you build, if your children are built up on the word of God, your children will last. If you take a business and you build your business on the principles of the word of God, your business will last. If you take your finances, and you order and you arrange your finances based on the word of God. The rains will come and the wind will blow. But when it's all said and done, your life will still be standing if it's built on the word of God. Build your life on the word of God. Amen. And Jesus never said it wouldn't be storms. He never said it would be easy. He never said, but no matter what comes. Sometimes the world needs to see us go through a storm to see when the storm is done, we're still standing our marriage survived, our children survived, our home survived. If you build society on the word of God, when they took the word of God out of schools in America, they decided that this place was now no longer going to be a sure place. It's going to be shifting and it's going to fall apart. And sure enough, ever since that has happened, society is just falling apart. You take the Bible out of anything, it will fall apart. But if you build anything on the Bible, on the rock, on the sure foundation, it will stand. And... This is the cool thing. If you build your life on the word of God, it will actually be built out of the word of God. It will be built out of the same rock that stands the test of time. And you've ever seen some of these places that they actually etched their home out of the rock. That house ain't going nowhere. You can decorate it and centuries will pass. And we see some of these thousands of years old because they hewed it out of the rock. And that's what God wants us to do. Not just build your house on a rock, but build your house out of the rock. Build your house out of the word of God, because then no storm will ever be able to take it down. The word of God is a foundation. Number two, the word of God. Not only is it a rock, but it goes down deep. It goes down all the way to the ocean floor. The reach of God's word. This island is incredible. Let's go down there. To the depths of heavenly wisdom. Let's jump in. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man what the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. Haven't you heard this about, oh yeah, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, forget about it, y'all. No, it's not the end. But God has revealed it unto us yeah. by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. The Word of God is deep. It's shallow enough that a child can, can wade into the shallow water and understand the Bible, understand who God is. But it's also deep enough that the deepest theologian will never be able to plumb its depths. You'll never be able to understand everything there is to know about God from the Bible. We will spend all of eternity continuing to learn and know and experience God in His fullness. Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the death of the riches, both of the wisdom 
and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. God's word can take you down to the depths of heavenly wisdom. There's a way our world lives life. There's a way our world understands things. There's a way our world understands themselves. And it's very simple. It's very, it's very ignorant. Ignorant of the traps that are set. Ignorant of the pathway. Ignorant of the plan of this world. And God has revealed his plan to us. If you open the Bible, you can see. You can hold it up like a grid and be like, oh, I know what's happening over there. I know what's happening over there. I can see what the devil's doing over here. I can see what's happening in that part. I can see the signs of the times beginning to line up. I can see. And I'm not shaken. I'm not messed up. I'm not falling out. I'm not fainting. I know that my life is built on the word of God. I know this world is going to pass away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So the nations will one by one crumble and fall, but we will be as children of God. God will take us up to heaven one day. This we know. So now when I turn on the news, I don't have to be, I'm not tripping. I don't have to be, oh no, I can see. Now what are they doing? And you turn on it again tomorrow because if it leads, if, if it bleeds, it leads. You know, if it's something that, if it makes people get in their anxiety, that's what they put on TV because for some reason, and you, you spend your time watching these specific news networks, they're just trying to make you mad or they're trying to make you worried or they're trying to make you anxious, they're trying to make you afraid. The Bible says this, fret not thyself yeah. because of the workers of iniquity. You know what the word fret means? I used to think it means to worry. Oh no, fretting. Oh no, that's not what fret means. The word fret literally means to pace back and forth in angry anxiety in your living room. It means, I can't believe what they're doing. <laughs> That's fretting. Have you ever turned on the TV or the radio or watched something on Facebook and thought, I can't believe this. And we get so angry. That's fretting. God says, don't worry about what they're doing out there. You worry about your life. I will build your life. I will make your life steadfast. You don't even have to fret about this world. Because God gives us the heavenly wisdom. And then it's the depths of the human heart. Now this, this is where things hit home for all of us. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. For the word of God is quick, that means it's alive and powerful. This island is a living island. This island is alive. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. So your body has joints and marrow. You have to take a surgeon's knife to divide between your joints and your marrow. The idea is you have to be a very skilled surgeon to know this is the spleen and this is the bone, to know this from this. So this is where the Bible says, God says, the word of God can divide between your soul and your spirit. God's word, like a surgeon's knife, can cut and show you this. The spirit is, is the part of me that relates to God. My soul is the part of me that relates to the world. That's my mind, my will, my emotions. That's where I get in my feels. That's where I get so angry. That's where I get upset and depressed and stressed out. That's your soul. Your spirit is what hears from God in love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, patience, meekness, temperance. That's the spirit. And sometimes you're like, what am I feeling? Why am I even feeling this? The word of God is that surgeon's knife that can cut and say, let me tell you, you need to stop thinking this. You need to start doing this. And sometimes we don't even know what we're doing. The word of God becomes our mirror to show us exactly what we're doing and let us know, you need to turn away from this. You need to back away from this. That's the power, the depths of the human heart. Watch this. And it is a discerner of the thoughts, verse 12, and intents of the heart. You read the Bible, the Bible, the Bible reads you right back. Right. It knows what you're thinking. It knows who you really are. It knows the depths of the human heart. The Bible says in Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You ever seen somebody who is desperate? I'll say this. Sometimes people want money. They like money. The love of money is the root of all evil. But wanting money, liking money is different than being desperate. People will commit almost any crime when they're desperate for money. You ever seen someone who's at the edge of life, like cornered like a, 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 like a wounded animal, and they get desperate? They get violent because they are in survival mode. That fight or flight kicks in. Desperate. 
The heart is desperately wicked. You try to get between someone and their sin when they are desperately trying to get that, they will ravage you like a wolverine to get to their sin. And that's, I've seen that in my life. I've seen that in other people's lives. That's what our heart is made of. And the word of God tells me that. That's what I'm made of. And I need to be aware that that's who I am. I need to see what I'm capable of. The word of God shows me that. Daniel 2 verse 22. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness. And the light dwelleth with him. God takes the word of God as a search light. David said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. God knows what I'm thinking right now. God knows what you're thinking. God knows what you're worried about. God knows what you're angry about. God knows what you're excited about. And the word of God is how he probes our life. So the word of God is, has a reach. And then lastly, we're out of here. The riches of the word of God. When a wrath got to the bottom and he plunked down and he turned around, he was like, oh, oh, I guess we don't really need to leave this island anyway because it'll take a lifetime to mine these riches and get them back to the surface. Arath swims back up to the top and he's like, hey, you guys got to come down here. Get anything you can put gold in. Uh, bring anything. Bring your belt. Bring everything. We're going to start bringing gold back from the bottom. And so the riches of God's word. I'll say this. If you're holding a copy of the scriptures, you're holding the thing that is more valuable than any amount of money you will earn for the rest of your life. Ten lifetimes. A hundred lifetimes. You'll never be able to amass enough wealth to equal the value of the word of God. And God says it about himself. He, he says it about it. Psalm 119 verse 14. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. All the riches in the world, if you put them together, they're not worth what the Bible. Because guess what? There will become a day where that currency is worthless. There are some currencies of former nations that are like, hey, I've got this uh, coin from the USSR. I'm like, that's worthless. That doesn't mean anything. That's gone. It's passe. And all of the currency, all the things that are valuable to us, 10 years, 15 years passes, they're worthless now because everything will pass away. But the word of God is priceless for all of eternity. So value it more. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, more than fine gold, it says in Psalm 19. Look what it says in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's the Bible. Make that your delight. Make that thing that... Something popped in my mind. I won't, I won't go into it. Delight in the word of God. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. It's the thing that consumes my thoughts. It's what I daydream about. It's what I'm thinking about when I'm not thinking. The word of God. If you memorize the word of God, it'll be in there. It'll be doing this thing in your life. Watch this. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Anything you do will work, whether it's your business, whether it's your marriage, whether it's your life, whether it's your children, whether it's your home, whether it's society, whether it's a government. If anything sets up and follows the word of God and is built on the word of God, it will prosper. God will make it prosper because the word of God does not return void. God sends it out and it accomplishes the purpose that he sends it out to do. God's word Everything obeys God when he speaks. And when his word goes forth, it happens the way he says it. And the word of God will make your life prosper. If you want to prosper in your life, if you want to have the true riches, not just what you can have in your bank account, the true eternal riches that last for all of eternity, the true spiritual riches deep down in your spirit, the word of God. And then Joshua 1 verse 8, the, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Only time the word success is mentioned in the Bible is about if you take the Bible and you meditate on the Bible, you will be successful in everything that you do. God guarantees it. The word of God, the riches of God's word. My wife recently sent me this, and it's going viral. I want to share it with you. The riches of God's word, here's what it looks like. This is real talk. There 
is a there is a study that they have done. It was uh, based on the, the Center for Bible Engagement. They studied 40,000 people and they polled them and they asked them questions. How do you live your Christian life? What do you do? And they came up with this. This is scientific research and they came up with this. They said, if you read the Bible one time a week, nothing happens. They, they followed. They, they, they did brain scans. They took polls. If you read the Bible one time a week, that's coming to church. Hey, I came to church. We opened up the Bible. If you do it one time a week, nothing happens. If you do it two times a week, still negligible. Nothing happens. It doesn't move the needle at all. That's Sunday night, Sunday morning, Wednesday, you know, whatever. But if you read the Bible three times in a week, you daily, you took a, a daily devotion and you read it and you, you stepped into the Word of God, into the light, into the river of God's Word, and it flowed in your life three times, there was a noticeable bump, but very little. A noticeable bump, but very little. But they didn't go in for this specific piece of information, but it was the biggest takeaway. Four times seems to be the tipping point. If you read the Bible four times in a week, that's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. If it's four times a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, here's what happened. Things began to unlock, and, and it was off the charts. When you read God's word four times per week, feeling lonely drops 30%. Feelings of loneliness are one of the biggest epidemic in America today. People feel lonely. They're so connected. We're more connected on our phones and on Facebook and Instagram and, and TikTok and Twitter and, and all the other ones and LinkedIn. We're more connected than ever and more lonely than ever. But that feeling of loneliness goes away 30%, drops 30%. Anger issues drop 32% because the word of God becomes a cleansing agent in our hearts. Bitterness in relationships drops 40%. This is bitterness in marriages, bitterness fathers, sons, mothers, daughters, grandparents. The bitterness of past hurts that have been unresolved and I can't believe that they, and that plays and that plays and that plays. Now all of a sudden the word of God is playing in its place and bitterness drops 40% in relationships. Alcoholism drops 57%. Something about the power of the word of God flowing in, rushing in. That sort of is like a, it's like when we have these flash floods that come in and it can unseat something that's been buried and the power of that water can break it free and shake it loose. That's what God's word does. And alcoholism is a stronghold for a lot of people. It breaks loose. Feeling spiritually stagnant. You ever been that like in your life? Man, I, want to grow, but uh, you ever tried to grow? You're like, <laughs> and I just feel like I can't grow. How do you grow? It's the word of God. Feeling spiritually stagnant drops 60% when you read the word of God four times in a week. Viewing pornography drops 61%. One of the great epidemics in our culture drops 61%. The power of God's word. And by the way, I'll mention it's this. Three days out of the week is three out of seven. It's not quite half. Four days out of the week is a little over half. Now it's like the majority of my week. I'm giving the majority of my prioritizing. That means now the word of God is a majority in my life. And it means I'm telling God this means something to me. And God begins to have breakthroughs happen in our lives. Viewing pornography drops 61%. Sharing your faith, the, the opposite side, the positive side. Sharing your faith jumps 200%. From reading the Word of God four times. You know why? I'm in the Word of God. I know it. I know it. Sometimes you're like, I share my faith, but I don't know what, I don't know what they would, I don't know how to answer it. I don't know what I truly believe. Now you're so in it. The confidence builds, the boldness builds. I see they share the Word of God and, and God helped them, God protected them. I'll share the Word of God. And it causes personal evangelism and witnessing to jump. Discipling others jumps 230% because of the power of God's Word. We begin to see what God is capable of. I read a story about a man that lived in China. He lived in a village. And that village was very spiritually dark and they were hungry. And they did not have any copies of the scripture in their village. And they wanted it so much they didn't know what to do because this was back in the 1940s. They're like, what do we... So they decided as a whole village, not too many people living in the village, that they were going to fast and ask God 
to send them a copy of the scriptures. So they fasted for 100 days as a village. And at the end of that 100 days, a page of the Bible came into the village. Somebody brought it in. The Bible in China was illegal. It was banned. And certainly to have a whole Bible so little pages would, would kind of travel. And a page made its way. And there was one of the young men in that village. His name was Brother Yoon. And he decided he was going to memorize that page of the Bible, front and back. And he memorizes a passage from the book of John. He memorized it front and back. And then that page of the Bible had to keep on moving. They wanted to share it with other villages. And so that village said, okay, you memorized it. They would sit down and say, tell it to us. And he would recite that page of the Bible every day until the whole village began to be able to learn this page. And then he would go out and preach to other villages. He had memorized.